Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us. We're just waiting for everybody to settle in and appear on your screens. Just waiting Sunny and Pilar now. Great, everyone's here. So hello and thank you so much for joining us for the first um, in the Art Newspaper's new series of live webinars made in partnership with Cromwell Place. And it's titled New Models for New Times, Rethinking an Art Market in the Changing World. Before I introduce today's talk, uh, just a little reminder that we will be taking questions at the end, so please submit those using the Q&A tab that you can see at the bottom of your screen. Today's panel is titled, Is the New Spirit of Collaboration Lip Service or Game Changing? Now, amid the coronavirus pandemic, there's been a new spirit of generosity among the art trade has seemingly sprung up, with larger galleries collaborating with smaller ones, dealers banding together, and auction houses collaborating with fairs whose live events have been cancelled. But is such a collegial atmosphere here to stay? And can ego individual egos really be pushed aside for the greater good of the industry? And what makes a successful partnership anyway? So with me here to discuss are four panellists who've all had their own dis different experiences of collaboration over the past six months. The art dealer Pilar Corias, who started her London gallery in 2008 and shows a diverse range of contemporary artists. Caroline Douglas, the director of the Contemporary Art Society, which really promotes investment in contemporary art for UK museums, and she works with a lot of commercial galleries as well. Sunny Rabba, the co-founder of The Third Line, which is a contemporary art gallery based in Dubai's Al Sakal Avenue, and she's also now a member of Cromwell Place in London and Neil Wenman, who is a partner and also director of brand at Hauser & Worth Gallery in, based in London. So, Pilar, perhaps I can come to you first and we can go back sort of to the beginning, back in March when galleries initially went into lockdown in London and this WhatsApp group sprung up um, of London galleries. Can you tell us a little bit about how that came about and really the help that it provided for galleries large and small? So um, Sadie Coles set up a WhatsApp group for all the London galleries. And as it was towards the end of March, and it was just as we were beginning to go into lockdown and there were, you know, I don't know, I think there were maybe 10, 15 galleries and then there were more and more and more until I think it's pretty much every contemporary art gallery in London is in it right now. And I think there's something like 120 participants in, in the WhatsApp group. In, and so it was very, like it was very shocking at the beginning to, um, to be entering into a period that we had no understanding about, no idea about, none of us were prepared. And uh, it was, I mean, it was, it was frightening. And um, so the WhatsApp group in a way allowed people to share ideas and thoughts about what to do, how to go about it, uh, do you close? Do you not close? Uh, when do you reopen? Uh, how are you dealing with your uh, landlords? <laughs> um, you know, there's many questions that, uh, you know, very practical questions that galleries had to deal with. And um, so it was really collegial and very useful. And um, out of this WhatsApp, uh, WhatsApp group, there was um, Oliver Miro, um, wrote in a, a text saying, I've started this uh, online, well, this VR app for viewing exhibitions. And I thought, oh, that sounds really interesting. I'm going to, um, I'm going to write to him. So I wrote to him and um, I saw that the, the app was actually really good. You could enter into an exhibition space and walk through it and uh, look at it, an exhibition without moving from your home and so in a period when you couldn't actually go into a gallery and you couldn't travel I thought wow what a fantastic fantastic tool and um, so out of the conversations between Oliver and I 
he suggested, let's do a London collective. Let's give an opportunity for all the London galleries to get together and to show their exhibitions that they would have otherwise have had in their spaces online. And, um, and I thought this is so great. So it's basically, there isn't, like if you try to go and see all the London shows in one day, it's almost impossible because all the London galleries are really, really spread out. And you know, London's a bit like LA, everything is very far away from, one is far away from the other. So I just thought this was actually better than, than going to see exhibitions in real life because you could see a lot in just the space of 10 minutes. And uh, so we set up a committee and then we reached out to all the different galleries and saying, do you want to be part of it? If you do, if you do contact Oliver. And um, there were, uh, I think, 50 galleries that, have, that are currently part of it. And uh, we wanted it to be very democratic. And we wanted it to have many different kinds of galleries, from, from very, very young, uh, new, small galleries to very, very big established ones. And everybody got the same space. Everybody um, uh, got to change, got the opportunity to change their exhibitions with the same frequency as the others. And it's, and it's free. And so nobody had to pay. And so by having these criteria, we knew that we were gonna be fair to everybody. And uh, we made a committee, which is comprised of Josh Lilly, Sid Motion, uh, Tommaso Corrimora, myself, and Victoria Miro. And uh, we just discussed on how to, um, you know, practically make it work. And we made a, an Instagram um, account as well, where we repost all the shows that the galleries decide to post. This was happening over the summer, right? This was sort of over the summer period that this was going on. We did it as quickly as possible. So the idea came about in April and um, we had it going, I think by the end of, beginning of July. It just okay. took time to organize it. Um, yeah. And uh, it was, uh, it's, I mean, it, it was a period of adjustment. And so this was kind of a, a tool that we decided that would be nice for everybody to be able to have. And um, it's gonna come to an end at the end of this month, just because people understand the situation now. They've, everybody wants to do something different and they wanna do different things. And um, so it just served its purpose. Mm. So I suppose it's this feeling that collaborations don't necessarily have to last forever. They can come to be born at a certain moment when they are mutually beneficial as well, because Oliver was obviously launching his app as well. And, and so it helped to get a certain momentum behind it too. Um, and then it, so it works for a bit, but it doesn't necessarily have to sort of be indefinite. Um, Neil, can I come to you? And I don't think that Housingworth was on uh, the Vortic app, but you've been doing other collaborations. Um, now, obviously, as I'm sure pretty much everyone watching will be aware, Housingworth is a very, very big gallery. Um, so you're sort of coming at it from perspective of a very large gallery with multiple locations and thinking about what you can maybe do to help perhaps your smaller colleagues. So perhaps you could tell us what you've been doing over the summer as well. Yeah, I mean, firstly, to reiterate exactly what Pilar said, you know, we did just all fall off a cliff. And, you know, we fell into this kind of ocean of unknown, you know, no one quite knew what to do. And I think that's something that we all had to grapple with. Um, and it was really challenging. And I guess, you know, you soon realise that digital has to be the way forward. Um, we had already begun investigations um, on virtual reality and kind of using technology. Uh, we began that about sort of a, a year ahead of COVID, but it was much more um, unrealized and it was actually coming out of an idea of sustainability and about reducing our carbon footprint. So we had begun looking at how can we build virtual reality of all of our galleries worldwide and artists could then develop their shows in the virtual world. Um, so that had to be kind of full steam ahead. We pushed that much, much more uh, full frontal. Um, and then we launched that 
which is kind of why we didn't actually take up the very generous offer of being part of Vortec, because we were about to launch our own VR um, with our Menorca project. So um, the question was, of course, what space do you build in this virtual world? Um, so we decided to build the space that had not yet been finished, which is our new space opening in Menorca next May, now May 2021. Um, and we did our first virtual exhibition there. Um, and that led us on to thinking a lot more about how we can collaborate with different sort of sections or sectors, I should say. So the first one we prioritized was health. Um, and we decided to partner with the World Health Organization. So for the entire uh, six months, 10% of all online exhibitions went into a fund specifically for them. Um, so we raised kind of multi-millions um, dollars for, for, the, for that over the whole summer period. Um, and we then looked at um, the idea of how could we help other galleries um, so alongside this series of exhibitions, we've now done 26 online shows. Um, we were approached by June Art Fair, along with Art Review Magazine, um, asking for us to all partner together in a sort of three-way partnership. Um, so June, June Art Fair, is, is a, it was the second edition, right? Just to sort of set it in context. And it had, yeah. last year from memory, it was a very sort of small, very much kind of emerging art fair. Um, exactly. at the total opposite end of the spectrum of the art market to where Hauser sits. Yeah, so it's the first edition last year in Basel and it's um, an art fair with no walls, you know, very much the kind of deconstructing notion of, a, of, of an art fair. Um, and they came to us and wanted um, really a digital platform. So um, alongside Art Review, we became the kind of third partner, as it were for the presentation. So 16 galleries, each did a solo presentation. We had no curatorial input on any aspect of the works being shown. Each gallery chose their own artist. Um, and we really offered them our digital expertise, the platform, and of course, our outreach. So um, in promoting the event, it went to our entire mailing list. And the 16 galleries then, of course, met new collectors. Um, and all sales inquiries went straight back to the galleries and they did all the transactions themselves. Um, so that okay, kind so of you didn't get involved in the, any of the traction, transactional stuff. And I think when we spoke before, and you, as you say, you didn't have any curatorial involvement. No. Um, and also they could keep their own branding. So it's quite a kind of, it, there's quite a lot of trust involved, I suppose, in handing over your brand, your mailing list, list and your website to people to do to put up the sort of art that they see fit as well and well, their own yeah, branding. Was. It was interesting actually, sorry to interrupt there Anna, it was interesting mm. because you know the conversations with the fair were always you know what would you like it to look like and I kept saying well it's your fair you know it should look like you we're, we're just the platform you know and and uh, and so then they developed the graphics and the graphic identity from the previous year um, with their team and uh, and I said you know we don't want any aesthetic involvement this should be all about you um, and an art review said the same thing so it, I think it worked really really well um, in the first weekend I think 32 artworks sold over 48 hours you know so there's quite a good traction of visitors um, we did it sort of, um, the exact date I think was the um, 8th of August I think it was for 10 days so it was the middle of the summer um, as well. And um, all in all, I think it was very, you know, beneficial and people got something out of it. it there were obviously no costs involved for any of the galleries. Mm. Um, and we obviously, you know, did everything um, in uh, complimentary or whatever the phrase is. Yeah. So it, it sort of was a, a nice way to kind of generate interest in the middle of the summer period. Right. Yeah. And you also had to, and again, something else that we mentioned is, these sorts of things rely quite a lot of buy-in from your own staff as well. It, it, it was sort of, you were sort of behind it all and one of the instigators, but um, obviously it involved on the part of Hauser sort of long evenings and a lot of man hours as well to sort of launch these things yeah. um, without the prospect of any sort of um, sales commissions as well coming off it. So, so yeah, I mean, were, were your staff kind of willing to get behind these sorts of things as well at the prospect with no sort of 
you know, kind of personal gain, I suppose. Yeah, that. no, totally. I mean, it was all done with the, exactly the right spirit. I think for June Art Fair in particular, it's more the digital team, you know, that right. they, and a lot of them are based in New York and LA. So with time difference, there was a lot of late nights, early morning conversations going on. Um, but it, more the case for our second major um, event, which was Artists for New York, which mm -hmm. was um, a, a gala charitable exhibition we opened in New York. It was to mark the opening of our new space in Chelsea on 22nd Street. So for that project, we decided that, um, you know, having looked at health, having looked at other galleries, we then wanted to look at art institutions, in particular in New York, because that was a very kind of badly hit um, place at that time. And also it ties in with the fact that we're open, you know, we're opening our new space there. So we partnered up with 14 art institutions um, to create a kind of charitable fund. And that's really in a sense what you're referring to in terms of the global sales team. Over a yeah. hundred different artists donated works, a hundred percent of all proceeds went to the 14 institutions. Um, and that, that show was sold by the House and Worth sales team. So in that sense, you're right. The, the, each person, you know, someone in Hong Kong was selling a work, someone in London was selling a work, all for the greater good of the, of the 14 institutions in New York. Okay. Um, and that the aim uh, was to, I mean, it's still ongoing, it's still open right now. Um, we've already reached $10 million. So yeah, it's, it's very much about giving back, realizing and appreciating the ecosystem that exists in New York and how without that historical cultural landscape, there would be no reason for Housing Worth to be opening a new space. So in a sense, we're you know, trying to give back to that his historical foundation. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to ask you, ask you what's in it for you and, and I suppose keeping that sense of the, this cheesy word that we always use, the ecosystem, um, is actually important. And yeah. it's a good PR line as well. We yeah, have to so if, it, if it weren't there, we wouldn't be there ourselves, would we? Yeah. You, know, mm -hmm. you know, we all need to be able to see art in different spaces, in non-profit spaces, in smaller museums, you know, that's the, that, that keeps everything alive, you know, mm. otherwise commercial galleries can't just exist independent of that. So. No, in a vacuum, which leads me nicely onto Caroline. Um, uh, Caroline, you are a kind of bridge between the commercial galleries and the artists um, and the, certainly the UK non-profits as well. So can you tell us a little bit about um, the Rapid Response Fund that you started earlier on in lockdown and what you've been doing over this period to help artists, but also institutions? Um, thank you, Anna. Um, I mean, I, I would uh, reiterate what Pilar and Neil said about the initial period of shock. Um, and I think we went through that as an organisation as well in the middle of March. Um, because of what we do, which is buy contemporary art for museums um, in the UK, we, we sort of sit at the centre of a really uh, complex network of artists, of gallerists, of museums, of independent curators. Um, and so as soon as I unfroze from my shock, um, my instinct was to get on the phone and start talking to people. And I absolutely concur with what Neil says about the, the ecosystem, the ecology, because what became really rapidly apparent to me through talking to lots of artists uh, was how deeply the effect of the lockdown was hitting the ecosystem at so many different levels and talking to artists who were having, you know, were stopped in their tracks, having had a career which was really taking off over the last five, 10 years, suddenly they didn't know if they could pay their studio assistants. Um, this was because, um, I suppose it's an event driven nature of the art trade had been stripped away. Was it because there were sort of not the fairs, the galleries were locked down, therefore they weren't having exhibitions, the sales vehicles have gone. The, the biennales um, stopped, so the, you know, the fees that might have been expected for those stopped, uh, commissions stopped in their tracks or got indefinitely postponed, residencies got postponed, um, you know, no longer the requirement to make work for art fairs, you know, suddenly the precarity of, of existence became incredibly clear. And as I was having those conversations, what became really clear 
suddenly uh, was the fundamental activity of the CAS, which is to invest, to inject investment into that grassroots level of the arts ecology. Um, and at the same time, thinking about, you know, the, the emptying out of uh, city centres and town centres across the country, um, it, it seemed to me that the museums, once they could reopen, would be incredibly important elements, uh, agents within communities across the country as soon as they could reopen. And what could we do to support those? And I'm afraid because uh, my mind tends to run that way, I suddenly leapt forward to what the next financial year might look like. Uh, for publicly funded institutions and how they needed support to advocate for their importance. We, we have been a very collaborative organisation for a, a long time. We have collaborations with the National Gallery, with the Henry Moore Foundation, with Film and Video Umbrella, for example. And four years ago, we started to collaborate with Freeze London. And we had uh, what we called our Collections Fund at Freeze, which was um, basically a purchasing circle. We brought together 10 of our patrons who uh, contributed to a fund which we brought to the uh, to Freeze London each year and made a really major purchase for a, a UK museum. It was a lovely um, symbiotic project which was great for Freeze, it was great for us, it was great for the museum, for the gallery, for the artist, it was fantastic. Um, one of the people I started talking to in May was Eva Langret and I uh, had my first conversation with her just on the heels of the cancellation of Freeze New York and the shock waves that started to uh, ripple through that. And it was the first moment when I could get my head around the fact that there might be a question mark over Freeze London this year. And it sounds naive now, but I think the, the enormity of, the, of this crisis was still you know, breaking upon us through that period. Um, and so it, it, it occurred to me, well, why, why should we wait to spend this money till the autumn when actually the need is right now. Um, so why don't we repurpose this fund, move it sideways and do something that is an immediate response uh, that gets money into those grassroots, gets money to the artists in meaningful sums so that uh, it provides a little bit more security and stability for some of those people, some of the artists and by extension, their galleries, their assistants, the fabricators, all the different uh, layers of activity that surround the production of art. So um, you were sort of concentrating very much at that, as you say, the grassroots level, the sort of level where, say, a five or ten thousand pound purchase would make a huge difference to an artist and yeah. a sort of material difference immediately. Yeah. I mean, we had our collections fund at Freeze had uh, typically spent about 60 or 70 thousand pounds on work by one artist or one or two. And we um, felt that uh, a purchase between five and 20 for more artists would be really would be would be enough to make a difference. And that it was that the situation demanded a, a broader approach to to reach more artists. Um, and uh, so I spent the first week talking to everybody who'd already agreed to contribute to the collections fund. And I was really incredibly buoyed up by their very, very positive response to, to my suggestion that we, we repurpose the fund this year. And, in, and then I started talking to more people. <laughs> and I think in about 10 days, we got to about 109,000 in uh, contributions. And at the same time, we were developing the idea of our very first ever crowdfunder, which I'd always resisted, um, and uh, which we went into with quite a lot of trepidation. Why um, do you, did you resist the crowd, crowdfunding model? I'm intrigued as to know beforehand why you, why you didn't like that idea. We'd never found a sort of framework for it. I think okay. in the past it had been suggested that we crowdfund for one particular artwork. And that to me made the artist vulnerable, mm. you know, to, vulnerable to failure. And that's not something one ever would want to do. So, um, so this, you know, to fundraise for a concept, i.e. supporting artists and supporting museums, um, was, was a, a more appropriate kind of framework for a crowdfunder. I was worried that it was too nuanced, that people wouldn't get it. Um, but my goodness, they got it. Uh, so we ran the crowdfunder online for only three weeks. And um, we thought we might make 20,000 pounds. We thought, you know, 
this is niche and everyone's thinking about a health emergency. Um, but what we found was that, you know, a huge number of people absolutely understood and in fact really wanted to find a platform through which to contribute and to do something to help. They, they totally got what was going on economically for so many younger emerging artists. Um, and so I think we had about, um, we had more than 1600 people contribute over a three week period. Um, and that continued to the, so the crowdfunder continued to be a partnership with Freeze. Um, and they promoted it through all of their VIP networks and their subscriber networks for the, for the magazine. And uh, together it became an incredibly powerful thing. And we raised in total um, just shy of a quarter of a million pounds in a month. Brilliant. And what have you spent it on since? Have, have you spent all of that fund? Then we yeah. set about spending it really fast. Rapid right. had to be getting it and spending it really fast. Yeah. Literally, you know, I think a, a 10, 20,000 pound purchase to, for an artist is, is something that will give them is some security for a few months. Mm. Um, and by extension, all those people that work with them. So I think we ended up buying um, work by 17 different artists for 17 different museums. Um, for the first time, we opened it up to art and uh, craft with no distinction between the two, which felt quite important um, to recognise the position of makers across the country. So it was, it was only open to UK based artists and craftspeople. And, right. Yeah. So it's think, interesting, something. Oh, sorry, Neil, I cut you off. No, I should say, I think that, you know, Caroline just really hit the nail on the head the framework. I mean, it was so important to us as well. And I think for everybody, we all tried to thought, well, how do we reach out? You know, where do we reach? Are we patronizing somebody and asking if they need help? Are we favoritizing somebody else because we didn't ask this other person, you know? And so in a way that was why for us, June Art Fair was a kind of perfect scenario because their framework existed. We just helped the entire system, you know. Uh, we didn't choose the galleries, we didn't choose the art, we weren't favoritizing it, you know, uh, one over another. Um, and I think in the past, we have developed, I mean, we have a very extensive education program, especially in LA and, and Somerset, and they have long-term partnerships. So for example, we have a education partnership with South London Gallery, we have a four-year partnership with CalArts, um, the university in, in, in LA uh, for filmmaking. And so, but these are structured, you know, they're frameworks that you've thought through and you've considered and there's a time period. And that's, I think, was the big challenge when, when yeah. COVID hit was that, 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 you know, a framework didn't necessarily exist for the type of help that we wanted to give. You know. Particularly when you're talking about maybe trying to help out your colleagues who are younger exactly. or smaller operations as well. And as you say, that sort of, yeah. although initially it sounds like it sounds like such a good idea to help them out, but that navigating the sort of personal relationships of not showing favoritism, not showing bias um, is sort of difficult to choose. But I think something that Caroline mentioned earlier on was about crowdfunding and not making a specific artists vulnerable, I think maybe the interesting thing about this whole period and why these collaborations have come about is because we are all, whatever level you are at, we're all vulnerable and there's this larger issue that is making everybody feel like they've fallen off a cliff, um, which is perhaps why it sort of it opened up and, and exposed the vulnerability about everybody in this industry that may not have otherwise been shown. But Sunny has been sitting there waiting patiently in Dubai. Um, now, Sunny, the rest of us all sitting in London, well, London or the UK, Brigsock, um, but Sunny is in Dubai. And so tell us a little bit about what has been going on over there among the sort of smaller network of galleries that exists in al Sakal Avenue, mainly. Yes, um, well, I mean, you know, we, same thing, you know, when, when this all happened, we, um, you know, it was just before our Dubai, actually, it was, uh, I think, about two weeks before our Dubai was about to, to begin and, and, you know, suddenly um, we went into this, uh, this moment and same thing, we're all in a state of shock, just trying to figure out, you know, what, what to do and how long will this actually last? And um, I have to say that, um, the, the art world here is very small in comparison to, to London uh, and New York and the other scenes, but it, it, was, it was really a great moment because suddenly, you know, all of us came together and, and I have to, to 
say that, you know, we all were so busy normally, you know, um, running around because usually we have to travel to other places to to meet every, to meet the rest of the world and suddenly we found ourselves in Dubai where we're waiting for the rest of the world to come here for this art fair that usually brings everyone uh, to us once a year um, and suddenly alone and 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 you know with with all that we had planned um, the the first thing um, I mean for me that 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 really touched me was that our, so Al Sirkal Avenue, which is where most of the galleries are in, uh, in Dubai, not all of them, but most of them, um, our, our landlord is um, Abdul Manam Al Sirkal, um, immediately reached out and um, we had same thing, we had a WhatsApp group and um, we all came together and started to really think about what we can do. Will the galleries be open? Will they be closed? We all mounted our, our March shows, which you know, for the most part are, are quite, you know, important shows because again, everyone is here during that moment. So um, it was very clear that we would not be able to, to open our shows. And also Carl uh, or Abdul Manam uh, kindly waived all of our, our rents for, for three months, which was extremely helpful. Because um, you can imagine we had not only Art Dubai, but some of us also had uh, Art Basel Hong Kong shortly after uh, Art Dubai. So we had, and then Art Basel Basel. So suddenly, you know, these three major fairs where we normally go out to and before the summer drought, uh, you know, in our region, the summer is completely quiet and is, is sort of, we do all of our work just before the summer and then, you know, um, come back in September. So it was very, very helpful. So I wanted to mention that. And it was really um, a community effort because, you know, as we were waiting to see uh, what, what, you know, would be available to us and, and, and sort of at a, at a more, um, at the level of the government. And I think the government was more busy just trying to manage this health crisis that is happening. So we, um, and, and things have happened since then. So I just want to make sure that that, you know, that's mentioned, but at that moment we had no idea. And um, so that was the first thing that, that, that happened within our small community. Um, and the, the next thing that happened was I received a phone call from, I know you'd mentioned Not Cancelled, but before Not Cancelled, uh, there was In Touch, which was organized by uh, a group of Indian galleries uh, spearheaded by Experimenter in Kolkata. And we received an email saying, you know, we're 10 Indian galleries and we're inviting uh, Dubai galleries to come on board with us. And we're, we're making a platform whereby um, we're going to do a show called In Touch and each gallery can show up to 10 works. And they did it very, very quickly. And I think it was April, I think it was April 25th, which was the, the, their first presentation and it was all online. And we all participated in the cost of building the platform, um, basically. And the idea was that, you know, we are in this region that's already so far away from the more, um, uh, typical uh, or, you know, more populated um, art centers of the world. And it was a really beautiful moment, I think, because we all usually find ourselves alone anyway. So, but now we're alone together. So I, I thought that was a, a, a really uh, beautiful moment that we all were able to come together, not just within the, the Middle East, but also uh, India. So, and we all often do see each other. And we do often have this sort of, you know, crossing of, of, of collectors that we all know, but in this moment, you know, we, we all opened up and um, shared our, our resources and our, and our networks. And uh, so that was the first um, platform uh, that we participated in. And, um, and then after that, we, we participated in Not Cancelled, which basically uh, began in Vienna. And uh, they did, I don't know if they did uh, Paris before or after, but they, you know, same thing, they came to Dubai, so they did it by city. And so again, um, a lot of uh, the galleries here participated in that platform. To be honest, you know, I think we were all in the same position. We just, we didn't know, and we wanted to make sure that we were still uh, providing visibility for the artists that we all work for. So, I mean, we were, we were in this position, well, will it work, will it, will it not work? But what I, do also agree with, with Neil is that, you know, we had been thinking about digital platform platforms, especially being in the Middle East, because, you know, normally the, the way that we had been going out to the world was via art fairs, and uh, which is great, but it's not necessarily, um, 
environmentally that that conscious i would say and that's something that i had personally been thinking about and um you know shipping works halfway across the world for four days and ourselves and some other people from our team and only to to ship it elsewhere or back um always sort of was was it was problematic for me but um but of course it was the only way for us to 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 come out to to the to the world and to be able to you are being a little bit more isolated from the rest of the art world which is so centered normally on sort of london or new york or hong kong you have to go to yeah yeah, so normally we did feel isolated anyway but this but this Mm. moment somehow actually brought us closer i have to say i i I feel that it wasn't that we were as isolated because i felt you know i was speaking to my colleagues in new york and london and paris and and suddenly we were actually very connected um, in that we were all in the same situation. So I have to say that, you know, we, I spent a lot of time on the phone speaking to many people, um, not just in, in the region, but, you know, everywhere. And, and um, it was a really, I felt it was a really great moment because it felt that, you know, normally we're all so busy um, that we hardly had the time to even sit, let alone think. And finally we were able to do that. And um, we're still working on, on other ideas, but we're definitely uh, developing our digital platforms and participating in, in, in other ways of, of reaching um, the, the public, our audiences. And with the thing, the interesting thing as well at the moment is along with collaborations and part of it is this blurring of boundaries as well. And with things like um, Al Sakal Avenues, um, the galleries there partnered with Sotheby's and you did, you did the Sotheby's sale too. And there's been a lot right. of those dealer um, and gallery sales going on. And there had been yeah. a bit of a kind of Chinese wall, you know, bet- between the between the two beforehand. And it's really interesting to see how how that is working now. Because did that 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 was quite sort of commercially. Because we've also got to consider the kind of commercial success of these collaborations. They're very civic minded, but they've got to work commercially. And yeah. things like some of these things did that work well for you on a sort of commercial level too? I mean, I think it's important in context because um, you know. Dubai is, I mean, if you think about it, really, it's only the art, the, you know, we've been around, for, we turned 15, actually, it was our 15 year anniversary, we were celebrating it in March, didn't happen, but we've now been celebrating it all summer as well, so it's great, we have this extended celebration somehow uh, from behind the screen, but, you know, the art scene really here is so young, and the auction houses really came in almost at that same moment that, you know, Art Dubai started, that you know, we had opened for a year and then suddenly Christie's and Sotheby's and the auction houses were in here and then Art Dubai began. So in a way, they have been a, a part of our ecosystem. Yes, there is definitely an, you know, perhaps an uncomfortable um, situation there that I'm not gonna, you know, we, you know, we may or may not agree, but I have to say it's worked very differently for us here because the auction houses, when they did, when you know, we all sort of started, we've all worked somehow um, closely in terms of our platforms and networks, you know. And so when this happened, um, the galleries actually banded together. So, um, you know, finally there's a, a WhatsApp group with, with all of the Dubai galleries on it, which is great. Um, we're not that many, we're really 11 in total. Um, and so we thought, okay, well, let's, let's do something. How do we have a, a further reach than just our own networks, which, you know, we thought, well, you know, maybe one of the auction houses would be uh, interested in, in supporting a sale. And uh, Sotheby's uh, came on board and we did a sale um, for, it was called uh, This Too Shall Pass. And uh, we actually, we linked up with UNHCR for the refugees uh, crisis and they basically, 10% of the sales of that auction went towards um, the UNHCR and then the rest of the funds were for the artists and and the galleries. And it was really, and that was in June. uh, So that was quite early as well. And that was really just another way for us to, yeah, to to continue to to still be um, around. Yeah. And that, that feeling as, as well with um, a lot of these initiatives uh, collaborative and then maybe giving a, a portion of proceeds to charity as well, which seems to be kind of, well, it, it's a seemly thing to do at the moment as well. And that, that it doesn't seem quite right to be doing things that don't have some sort of charitable element, even when they're collaborative as well. Um, it strikes me as. Um, 
you mentioned that the auction was called This Too Shall Pass, but it doesn't look like it's going to pass over the whole of the winter at the moment. Um, so I hate to bring it up, but what, um, what are your sort of future plans over the winter? Are there going to be any other kind of collaborative initiatives that you can talk about? Um, maybe Pilar yeah. first, is there anything that you're planning on doing? Or Sunny, sorry, you were about to say something. No, 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 we can go back to Pilar. Okay, Pilar. Well, I mean, in terms of, uh, you know, I brought, we brought all the London galleries together with Vortic mm. and that's finishing at the end of the month. But in a way, what we did do is that we, we showed that there was an opportunity to go beyond just an online viewing room, that there are other platforms that you can use. And so, um, you know, being able to enter a, an exhibition virtually is very different than looking at a, a scroll of images one after the next. Mm -hmm. um, Vortic is continuing and it's, uh, people can, can be part of it. And it's, uh, it's just not just for London galleries, it's just been opened up to everybody. So that's, I mean, that's as far as my online uh, collaboration has gone so far. It's gone so far, yeah. Um, uh, Caroline, we spoke a little bit about next year. Um, it's not going to be a particularly easy one for non-profits and things. What do you, sorry, Pila, I'll come back to you. I do, though, feel that um, it's very, very, very important to be assisting institutions right now. Mm. Because institutions have had their funding cut hugely uh, all over the world and so um, I mean one thing that we are doing in the gallery is that any way that we can help uh, museums that are we might have a project with and that's been postponed or um, that is in the pipeline we just give them as much assistance as possible and I think that you know I'm worried about it I'm worried about what's going to happen to institutions worldwide because the length of this um, situation is, I mean, it's going to be long. Mm. And, um, and I think it's very important to be able to go and see art physically and going to a museum is probably one of the best places to go and do that. And it's what we've all been missing so much, I suppose. And as you say, it's next year is, is going to be a worry for us all because this year at least we've had a certain amount of kind of tailwind to carry people through, whether that's commercial galleries or, um, or institutions as well. Um, just what, what exactly did you mean by helping institutions by with on project. projects being sort of helping um, with production and being flexible, that well, sort of thing? Of course, you know, I mean, giving them money uh, yeah. that they need. And you have to be super understanding and very, um, uh, you know, you really have to listen. And, uh, and, I, and I also foresee, I mean, I don't work in an institution, but I also foresee that museums will be collaborating with each other so that um, I think that to put on an exhibition is expensive. And um, so perhaps the same show can travel to different locations and different museums will um, tour shows to each other's, you know, to different, to different places because everything has become more local. Mm. So you know, it's because people can't travel, uh, you know, I mean, how many people from Hong Kong will see the Warhol show in London, you know? It's, um, the Warhol show probably needs to go to Hong Kong. For yeah, the sharing of information and cost sharing as well, whether, whether that's um, institutionally with sharing shows or whether it's galleries sort of thinking, well, because traditionally with going around all these art fairs and everybody's been so busy and shipping their own works independently, there's been a lot of wasted money um, going on. So maybe the entire part of this collaboration is just becoming more efficient as well within, within the industry too and talking to each other um, when we might not no normally. Um, Caroline, can I come to you um, just on the sort of institutional side and what the Contemporary Art Society is thinking about doing sort of going into next year as well? I mean, for the remainder of the autumn and remainder of this financial year up to the end of March, we're going to continue with all of our all of our existing purchasing schemes. Now, the rapid response fund um, was spent by the end of July, so we worked very hard on that, and now we continue with all of our uh, regular um, activity. Um, I, I do expect the, the major 
economic impact on our museums across the country here in the UK to be felt next year. Um, I think, you know, the tailwind that you refer to, uh, I, would, I would interpret as, you know, most of the publicly funded organisations having their budgets set for this year. And uh, obviously they're, they're managing dramatic loss in income and the, the shadow of that will fall into the next financial year. Um, I'm seeing already a lot of institutions are opening for many fewer days in the week, for example, so they're reducing their costs wherever they can. And there have been a couple of institutions outside of London that have announced major redundancies. So there's, there's going to be a lot of pain next year. And um, I really believe very passionately in the importance of museums within their communities, within their towns and cities. And, you know, city centres are going to change. You know, people are not going to go shopping anymore. The shops and the restaurants, the pubs, all of that, you know, is uh, city centres are going to change uh, in ways that uh, I think we're all starting to foresee now. But the museums will still be there and they're still a touchstone for our histories, our, our sense of place, and um, and they, as such, they're incredibly important. So I see our role as really reinforcing the the importance, the the vital uh, agency that museums have in their communities, and that's about uh, not just you know speaking in forums like this, but also continuing to add contemporary works into those collections in a way that emphasises how relevant they are, how. You know, the museums represent an ongoing conversation between the right now and and the distant past and that it's a continuum. Mm. Um, and that, you know, yeah. incredible museums that are so, so vital to the, the character and the identity of different towns and cities and they matter immensely. Mm. So they want that localism, but they also want to be connected to global and current issues. And I think that one way to do that and bring people together is through contemporary art. And that's why I, I really believe what we do is an important thing, particularly now as communities, you know, the, the, the environment of city centres is going to feel very different. Mm, and community is not something we can take for granted anymore. And I think people are valuing it in all areas even more now. Um, we're going to have to move on to Q&A soon, but um, can I just do a quick fire round at the end? Just if you could give sort of one piece of advice to people who are thinking about entering into some sort of collaborative initiative or partnership, what would you say to them um, about going into it? Neil, what would you say as a sort of little piece of advice to people to get them through this winter together? Goodness, um, I think definitely the key word there is framework. You know, mm. get the framework right from the get-go. Make sure that all the partners have the same ambition you know, going forward, that all want the same result. I think that's really critical. Just to, to uh, briefly sideline, two of the threads that I'm really focused on and the gallery is really focused on actually out of this, not only education and, and institutional health, etc., but, you know, one of them is actually mental health, which I think hit really hard on a lot of people within the arts as well. Not, you know, of course, mm -hmm. the wider community as a whole, but particularly in the arts. And we did a um, staff exhibition of staff work. Over a hundred of our staff members put work in. And, you know, and it was really a chance for them to, to kind of express themselves. And I think that that's kind of critical, absolutely critical. Um, and we're trying to do more and more work related to the idea of mental health. Um, and then I think secondly, sustainability, which is what Sunny referred to as well, uh, in terms of shipping works for art fairs around the world and, and joining forces and galleries sharing the sea containers, uh, you know, and, and whatever we can. And, and that's another kind of critical way forward in terms of focus. Right. How can we all reduce our carbon footprint? Our footprint, yeah. Um, Sunny, what would you say? Um, I, I agree completely with, uh, with Neil. I mean, one of the, the things that I've been thinking about because um, it's true, I mean, the digital platforms are great, but you know, as Pilar was saying, people, you know, and, and I agree with Caroline, we do need to still, um, see works, experience them, to be in the same space with them, to, it's, it's, you know, there's nothing that will replace that for now. And um, so I've been thinking about ways that I could, so to be environmentally conscious and not to 
ship works half across the world. I mean, for me, um, most of the artists that, that we work with don't live in the region. Some of them do, but uh, very few in Dubai, um, is to look at different spaces that I can collaborate with. So, you know, almost like the condo style, where instead of me uh, shipping works from, let's say, LA to Dubai to do a show in Dubai, I would collaborate with the space in LA because my artist is in LA and it's a lot less, you know, uh, uh, you know, well, a lot less expensive, but also it's much more environmentally conscious to have those works take from their studio to a gallery or another space. Um, so I'm thinking about ways in, in which we can still do what we do, but perhaps not in um, our physical space here in Dubai, yeah. and to do things high that we can do that also makes sense. So I think it's not just a matter of financial feasibility, it's also a matter of environmental feasibility. And, yeah. and again, on, um, I agree, and you know, really, my my thoughts and my, you know, has been really been with my artists in this time because I I also and, and I haven't been reactive for that reason. I I, you know, I know people at the beginning were very reactive and wanted to sort of you know do everything and be everywhere and you know and it, you know, but I felt that it's a it's a time that we all needed to also be by ourselves, quiet and with our own with our community. And so you know, I think that. Time is, 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 is good, and I think this time we've all had to, to think and rethink um, has been important. I think perhaps we can still use some of the winter to continue to, to think and see what works, what doesn't work, but to really primarily to, to be better at the end. Okay. Of it, so. um, I better actually push us on to questions, otherwise we're going to go over time. Um, we've had quite a few in. Um, first of all, Somebody has asked, um, in the legal profession, we've been talking about whether to continue using some of the systems that we've put in place, such as conducting hearings online and using e-bundles rather than paper, um, even when we go back to whatever normal is. Um, do you think there might be a similar thing in art, uh, for example, using virtual walkthroughs and online exhibitions in, sort of in tandem with a physical show? Um, perhaps Neil or Pilar, um, one of you would like to go, go for that. Neil, why don't you? I can just, uh, oh, sorry, Pilar, go ahead. I mean, I just think that it's here to stay. I don't think that, um, I think that the, it, I mean, what's the pandemic has brought out is things that were already happening just, in, just became very apparent. And uh, I think that it's great that we can do things online and, and lessen the carbon footprint, but we still need to look at art. So I think that in the future, there'll be a mix of both things. I mean, none of us, well, very few of us maybe would have been okay with just a, a Zoom meeting like we're doing right now, but now it's kind of become um, really, really commonplace. So we, we, I think we all learned a lot in the past few months. And, um, and I think the systems will get better as well. And, uh, and I, yeah, definitely here to stay. Anyway, sorry, Neil. No, no, it's true. I was, I'm saying the same thing. <laughs> you beat me to it. Um, I think for, for us, digital is not a replacement. It's an enhancement. And I think that's really critical. You know, of course, the joy this week of being in the gallery, standing front, in front of the painting, seeing the texture, you know, smelling the paint, whatever, that's never going to go away. You can't, you can't replace that in a digital realm. But what you can do is offer many other angles, you know, uh, uh, spatial possibilities that you can't necessarily have in the real world. So mm -hmm. there's a way in which digital can enhance, but it can never really fully replace. Yeah. I understand it can't replace, but I suppose also once we've embraced technology, we never, we rarely go back from it as well. It's not sort of within human nature to then just suddenly stop using these things. Um, Caroline. Yeah, no, I, I would agree that we're, this, the two modes of looking at art are here to stay, but I would, I would also add that, and especially since I've spent the last couple of days wandering around galleries in Mayfair, um, what is irreplaceable is the conversation you have in front of art with people. And that I don't think you can have on Zoom. The way that one would visit a gallery and speak with either the friend that you go with or somebody that you meet there. I'm also thinking about the way that one introduces young people to work if they're not familiar. I mean, maybe the, the online is something that for professionals and for you know committed collectors is 
is a more ready solution than it is for introducing people who aren't so familiar to, to work and for the sheer joy of standing in front of mm. work and talking about it informally without a microphone in your hand, you know? I don't think you're likely to remember, say, on your deathbed, the first online viewing room you ever saw, are you? But you might remember the first, you know, art exhibition you see in the flesh. Um, maybe yeah. I'm wrong. Um, actually, Ca no, Caroline... Rooms, <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Thank God for the viewing rooms, though. Thank you. Well, th yes, thank goodness we have them. <laughs> I shouldn't be too rude about online viewing rooms at all. Um, Caroline, we've actually got a question here specifically for you, saying museums will have to make redundancies, prolong exhibitions, and have fewer of them. But is there a way of, um, is there a way that they can collaborate to cut costs and perhaps share some services? And are there any discussions going on that you are aware of? Yes, I am aware of conversations going on. There's a lot of conversation about this. I think um, that the, well, the museums I know of are taking a really pragmatic approach to it. And so talking about uh, other, you know, the conversation is within museums in the same region, for example, and how they can uh, lend to each other, how they can share exhibitions, how they can share resources. This is for sure going mm. on. Yeah. Good, yeah. good to hear it. Um, we've got another question saying, when the pandemic finally ends, do you think that the art market will eventually return to the way that it was in 2019? Or is the era of galleries attending six, seven, eight fairs a year um, over? Who would like to take that? That's an interesting question. I wonder myself. Uh, <laughs> Are you still unsure about it? Or is it too hard to think past the end of the pandemic? What it was. Sorry? I don't think it will go back to what it was. Mm. I don't think that the same kind of frenzy uh, is going to reappear. First, because the thing about the pandemic also, it's also taught us a lot about ecology and we're understanding that the environment can recover. And, uh, you know, we've we're seeing some really good things about it. And uh, so it's, become, it's made us much more aware and, uh, and also, I, I think that there'll be other health scares. I don't think this is going to be the first. So I think that there will be fairs, but fewer of them, and maybe in different ways. And maybe local fairs will become more important, and the big international ones will become less. So I, I don't know. Sunny, what would you think about that? I agree. I think that, um, you know, to be honest, you know, I was, I, I do love, I, I like being at the fair once I'm there, but I, I was quite relieved to not have to go to fairs. I mean, it wasn't the best thing uh, for business, but it was definitely a, a relief in terms of just being able to, you know, stay. I, this is the longest I've been in Dubai um, since maybe I was 10 years old. So I, it's been nice to reconnect and, and I, I, you know, but of course the, the fairs are important, but I, I agree with Pilar. I think it's going to be probably more local fairs, um, and yeah, we've all realized that, you know, we, I mean, I, you know, we, I think we all knew, but we just didn't know when it was gonna stop, and I think this was, this moment was gonna come eventually, you know, and so, yeah, perhaps, and, and let's see, I also think people are getting used to seeing the fairs online, I mean, Freeze is going on right now as we speak, and I think, you know, when our Basel Hong Kong first went online, that was very early, and, you know, people were so, but I think as they, they're going along, they're getting better. So if we can do the fairs in that way, the, the larger fairs, why not? Mm, just be more selective over them. Um, it's, it's, it's a bit less creative to encounter everything on a screen. Like, mm. it's very hard to experience a sound piece and it's very difficult to experience an installation. So, um, and also, also but, not every work looks good on screen you know yeah. not every work is jpeg friendly and i think that's a real problem is that in this period of course the art that that, that looks good online does better and not necessarily is all art online friendly you know so i think that needs to be taken into consideration when we're back into the kind of real world steps i think that with art fairs they had already begun to change their branding into a cultural event rather than a transactional event and that was very much kind of you know larger uh, education larger events larger networks within city within the city it was in freeze i think is a brilliant example of that and 
that's where the art fair's future lies, is going to be this absolutely embedded in its place, in its locality, you know, and Freeze is London. I um, thought the, um, the uh, initiative that Art Basel did with different cities, so they went to, I think, Buenos Aires. I think that for me was kind of, oh, this is the beginning of something new. When they go to a city and kind of activate it. Yeah, it could have worked really well. I think it only ended up being one city, though. I mean, that was... Just, yeah, but it was kind of interesting. Really. It it's was not interesting so as a concept. Yeah, and as you say, Neil, it's sort of the cultural uh, moment that these art fairs provide is actually becomes the, the event itself, as we've seen in Freeze, when the actual event can't happen. Um, Freeze Week is still there sort of in, in spirit as well. And perhaps it'll become more important if we unfortunately, unfortunately lose non-profits as well um that they may have to sort of step into the breach in certain cases i hope not but mm. um somebody else has also asked that although these changes have come about during massive change um taking place all over the world what do you think this quick response gallery gallery community approach will or sorry do you think that this uh, gallery community approach will continue once a post-covid normal is established um do you all think I that this sort of this spirit will can will can carry on I think so. I think there's been quite good kind of, um, uh, you know, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Collaborative for sure, but kind of camaraderie as well. And, you know, quite dark sense of humour floating around, you know, sort of uh, with people, because, you know, we're all in this very, very dramatic moment together. And I think that is the critical thing that Caroline mentioned about kind of reacting to the now and also the artist's voices. I mean, that was on the critical things for us when we pushed our digital platform is that we had to get the artist's voice out and it had to be their response to now, not the gallery's response, you know? And I think that that is still to this day true. I mean, we're still going through it. It's not over yet, you know? Um, that's why I, I kind of brought up mental health because I think that's now this new wave of of things that need to be looked at and, and addressed is that these are becoming more long-term changes in people's daily behavior or, you know, working from home or furlough or all these aspects of the kind of working day also affect artists as much as they do gallerists, you know, mm. artists mm. that we work with who couldn't get to their studio for, for eight weeks. And they, you know, the, the frustration that was building up in them, you know, so, um, yes, I think it's affected it's, artists in lots of different sort of ways as well, and I suppose yeah, it's how yeah. you're mentally predisposed to, to cope with this, as well as the kind of work that you make as to whether you can start doing works on paper at home or whether you need to be in a, in a studio with a production crew as well. Um, yeah. One last question relating to artists, and perhaps this is a good one for, for Caroline, although maybe the galleries won't like this one so much, but will COVID, do you think it'll drive more artists to represent themselves on things like Instagram um, and other sort of direct to collector means? Um. That's an interesting one. I mean, there's there's been uh, the initiative, the Artist Support Pledge, uh, which has been that and has been phenomenally successful where artists have posted their own work and when they got up to having, I think the maximum they could sell for was £200 and when they right. had uh, made £1,000 then they had to pledge to buy another artist's work. Um, that is a model which I think is really groundbreaking and it's mobilised millions across the world. I mean, it started in this country and rapidly became international. Um, I think that's, that's a model that's going to evolve. Um, and one of the things I just wanted to say more generally about what we've learned over, um, over the last six, seven months is if you perceive a need, then don't overthink it, just get out there and start doing something, you know, and, and learn, learn by doing. And, you know, the, sec the secret to successful collaborations is, as Neil said, you know, about aligning your, your uh, desired outcomes. You know, when you have two organizations who, who basically uh, are uh, committed to the same community of, of artists or whatever, uh, that's very important, but just, get out there and do it. I mean, I know that this is, this is not uh, an art world specific um, impulse. I know this from speaking to lots of our uh, supporters who support medical charities and other initiatives. Uh, and as the crisis sort of unfolded, they perceived 
particular needs in very niche areas which they were perfectly placed to respond to and i think that is an is a new spirit for mm -hmm. me that's my perception which good is note fantastic. to end on yeah <laughs> good note to end on so maybe just uh, less thinking and more doing yeah. is needed and do it. we've got too much time to think anyway now well thank you so much all of you for joining us uh, for this discussion and thank you to our audience as well. Um, we hope that you will join us again next Thursday, which is the 15th of October at 5 p.m. BST or 12 p.m. EDT for our second discussion, which is titled Breaking Boundaries, Local is the New Global. And that will be moderated by my colleague, Annie Shaw. So thank you very much. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks.